Thank you for having me here. Thank you so much for agreeing to this. So, um, as Ms. Liana said, I am Rita Adiko Cohen. I'm originally from Ghana. I was born in Accra, and we immigrated to Norfolk many, many, many years ago. So, being here and having this nonprofit, which I founded in 2017, is very, very meaningful. I feel like I've come full circle. So, just a little bit about Taka, the Tidewater African Cultural Alliance. We are a nonprofit and we strive to unite the greater Tidewater or Hampton Roads region through community outreach, community service, educational programs, and cultural arts and events. And we've been doing lots of fun and interesting things every, almost every month of the year, not just for Black History Month, which we happen to be in. I had heard of Besara Bebebe uh, about three years ago, and I was absolutely intrigued, because this is even before Wakanda and Black Panther, and he was authentically creating, through Ekan Comics, and producing African superhero content in his comics. So I was very intrigued, and I was trying to figure out a way how we can include him in our programming and the things that we do. So knowing that he would be available to come here, and this is a, a collaboration, what we're doing tomorrow actually, is a collaboration between TCC and our organization. So knowing that he was coming for that, I asked if he could be also available to work with and talk to some high schoolers. And then here we are. So let me tell you a little bit about him. Very, very interesting background. So, Basara Bebebe is the founder of Etan Comics and the writer, creator of the first Ethiopian superhero, Jemba and Ham. He was born and raised in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. He holds a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Maryland and a master's degree in business administration from Indiana University. In 2018, which is the same year that Taka became a nonprofit, <laughs> his love for graphic novels and fantasy stories led him to establishing Etan Comics, a pan African entertainment company bringing African stories to life using comics and graphic novels created by African storytellers. His works have been nominated for Best Graphic Novel Awards and featured on BBC, OK Africa, <coughs> Comics Beat, and many, many more. Ladies and gentlemen, please meet Mr. Beserat Debebe. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. I just realized that I have to move, like motion the slide, so I may have to switch positions with you. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here. I am very happy to be here to share my journey, our journey with you. Um, <clears throat> before I do get started, uh, my hope from this presentation and all this engagement is to genuinely just help you discover any creative journey that you have or you want to pursue and show you what an actual you know creative's journey might look like if you decided to pursue that on your own as you've heard i majored in aerospace engineering not visual arts or creative arts like you guys did you guys already have way more advantage and i just will still want to show you though how my creative side influenced me into getting into this profession, this creative industry, uh, and just share my journey with you from my origins all the way to where we are now. With that said, uh, I do want to ask a quick question. Um, how many of you are fans of uh, superhero stories, fantasy stories? Just Okay, got a full room, great. Uh, I'm sure you guys are familiar with Marvel, DC. Uh, can anybody name me five African superheroes? No. It's okay, you can yell it out. Just go ahead. There you go. One, that's Storm. 
Vixen, very good. Did, uh, did, did, Black Panther, there we go. Unfortunately, that would not count. <laughs> so I'm, I'm asking specifically uh, like an African superhero. Of course, there are plenty of African-American superheroes that we, you can mention. But I'm, I'm genuinely interested in whether you guys know of African superheroes like, like, like Black Panther, Storm, for example, of Kenyan descent, and Vixen uh, from the fictional nation of Zambesi. Um, two more. Anybody? Uh, Shuri, um, so that would classify under Black Panther. So I'll, I'll, uh, uh, yeah. Blade. Blade? Blade? Oh no, unfortunately. Close, but not, 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 not that one. Okay, so I, I think that the reason I like asking that question is because uh, we have so many superhero stories. And every time I ask that question, it's quite challenging for people to name five handful African superheroes. So the, the representation of authentic African characters, right, is very much missing in this industry. And when we do get it, we get it in a form where they're from fictional nations, Wakanda, Zambesi. Uh, do you guys know about Zamunda from Coming to America? Uh, yeah, so, so there's this, there's this, this uh, kind of trope of uh, using fictional things because most people are very distant from Africa and they don't know African culture well. And although there are many talented writers and creators in Africa telling these stories, their stories never really seem to get out there into main platforms and be celebrated. So I wanted to preface it with that and tell you about my journey. I'm going to start from my, my beginning, okay? I'm from Ethiopia. How many of you know Ethiopia? Ethiopia, yes, great, okay. Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, the capital city. Uh, Ethiopia is the home and origins of many things. Uh, Ethiopia is the, known as the land of origins. Uh, the oldest, you know, the, the, it is, it is, the research has shown that humankind may have originated from Ethiopia, uh, particularly the Afar region. Uh, Ethiopia is the origin of coffee. How many of you guys knew that? Awesome. I'm so glad you did. I think I did hear about coffee. There you go. That's right. So the story goes, essentially, a shepherd saw his goat being super active after eating some leaves. He was like, what is going on? Like, I just want you to come home. He took that leaf, he took it home, shared it with the monastery that he, uh, that he uh, uh, attended, and they used that to, you know, they, they brewed it and used it to stay awake at night to do prayers then the fame of that grew and grew, and coffee became widely known. Uh, Ethiopia is also home to the first African gold medalist in the Olympics, Abebe Bakila. Uh, and Ethiopia is home to 70% of Africa's mountains, as you can see here in the topography. This right here is Ethiopia. 70% of Africa's mountains are in Ethiopia. So a lot of highlands. Uh, that's why we also have a lot of great runners from there because the attitude is high when they train there. Their, their, their lungs and their capacity and their strength are uh, also heightened there. Now, <clears throat> I told you about my origins. Now I'll tell you a little bit about my, how I got into animation. The first time I remember falling in love with animation and it was because of this Paramount Pictures, 1948, Superman animated show. We had one episode of that show back in Ethiopia. It was in a video VHS cassette. We would just replay it, me and my brothers, we'd replay it, we'd memorize it. It was an episode where Superman would save uh, Lois and many others from these mechanical monsters. I loved it. 
I absolutely loved this uh, uh, episode and I was just mind blown by how the cartoon was able to move so fluidly, the colors of it, even the story of it, right? This was my first introduction to animated stories and falling in love with them. This is my earliest memory. After that, of course, there are so many stories imported to Africa that we get to be very familiar with. Uh, you know, in, in Ethiopia, we used to have very limited access to these things. And the way we'd see them was there would be Saturday morning shows. Uh, and in those morning shows, the first part of the show is an elder coming and telling us a story, like an oral story. There's no animation or nothing about it. You just sit through that and sit through some dancing and traditional stuff. And then there's a 15 minute clip of a Disney show. We would sit through all of that just to be like, oh my God, I can't wait to see the next 15 minutes of Hercules or Lion King, right? And it would just make our whole week, right? The content was amazing and we'd have it in very small doses. Then I got into Harry Potter, started reading Harry Potter, mind blown. I'm like, oh my God, this is so amazing. I got into video games, me and my brothers. I have two brothers, one older, one younger, totally into video games. Talked about it in school um, and just made up characters of our own. And we just memorized even the moves of the video games. And just this was how we bonded and how we shared stories that we heard about and were imported to us to Ethiopia. Then I moved to the United States. Don't judge my style, it was cool back then. This was, this was, this was in, okay? Uh, so I moved to Maryland, United States, 2004, and I just remember significant culture shock moments for me. Uh, of course, I knew English, and you know, as I said, I read a lot, I watched shows a lot, so I was able to understand a little bit, but there were so many things that was just blowing past me. I, I, I felt so behind. Um, and again, I dove into more shows. Now, where I had doses, where I was used to doses of animated shows, <laughs> I had limitless amount, right? I couldn't, I mean, Saturday, it was Toonami or Dragon Ball Z. It was, everything was there. Like Saturday morning shows. Do you guys remember any of these shows? Shaolin, uh, okay. there you go, there you go. Yeah, so, so, you know, through all of this stuff, I started learning a lot about American culture. Uh, you know, American culture teaches you about individualism a lot. Uh, it's a very work hard and you will get what you, you, know, what you desire. Achieve, achieve, achieve culture, right? Um, <coughs> it will be later on that I obviously will realize that there's a downside to that kind of culture as well, which is there's a lot of undiscussed anxiety, undiscussed stress, vulnerability that is not shared with this achieve, achieve mentality, work, work hard, work 24 hour cycle, earn your status, earn your individualism culture. But hey, that is the culture I came here into. And you know, our parents moved us here because they believed that we had better opportunities to succeed in life here, right? So I learned about that a lot from animated stories. And then I got introduced to comic books at Borders Library. Borders Library is where I used to go to spend my time and hide from my friends to read comics. At the time, a lot of my friends uh, were definitely not into comics. Uh, and uh, they, you know, they had better things to do, you know, uh, uh, look, look for relationships and girls. And, and so they would not spend time with me at all in reading comics. So what I would do is I would say, hey, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll see you, uh, you know, in 10 minutes. And I'll just go into Borders, right? And then I would go into the comic section and then I would look at all the stories. And I realized that a lot of the movies that I used to see back home, back in Ethiopia, came from these comics. And the art was beautiful. And I was just mind blown by them. And so that was my first instance falling in love with comics and graphic novels. And then, of course, I started getting into manga. 
You know, the more I had to hide my love for comics, the more I couldn't afford to go and hide in borders anymore. And so I started reading online, where I started reading manga. Do you guys know this website? One manga? Yeah. It, it, it used to be huge. It got taken down because of piracy and all that stuff. But Naruto, I used to read weekly. It was, it was a big site. I used to read a lot of different genres too, right? It wasn't superheroes anymore. It was different things. And through manga, I learned about Japanese culture. I learned that Japanese culture uh, prioritizes honor, prioritizes family, hierarchy, right? Organization, not standing out. And most importantly, never giving up. If you have seen any animated show, you'll realize that a determined protagonist no matter if his leg is broken, if he's missing anything, whatever it is, if he's determined, he's going to save everybody. He never gives up. That's Japanese culture. That's Japanese values, right? They're sharing that. And I don't know if you know this as well, but <clears throat> the Japanese language is the fifth most studied language. Fifth most in the world. Now, 90% of Japanese speakers are in Japan. It is not practical at all, right? If you go outside of, you, you wouldn't, it would be better for you, for us to study Spanish or French because they can be practical during travels, a lot of countries speak it, right? But Japanese is the fifth most studied. Why is that? Manga and anime. They made us love their culture, right? They made us love, love, love their culture through these stories. Right? I don't know how many of you have seen Naruto eat ramen and be like, oh man, I want some ramen right now. And I, I, I know I've experienced that, right? Um, so I learned about Japanese culture. So American culture first and Japanese culture. Then college happened. I dropped completely whatever love and you know, comics and manga and all that stuff I had because I had to go to college. These two were my best friends. I, made, I got into aerospace engineering because what I prioritized was I needed to get financial stability. Uh, my, par my parents didn't come here so I can you know, major in art. That was drilled into me, right? And you'll find this is a very common experience in a lot of uh, African immigrant families. There's three majors, the golden majors that you're supposed to major on. There you go, there's the medical, or lawyer, or engineer. Those are the three majors. Anything else out of that, what are you doing? I didn't come here all this way, so you can do all. You know, you get all these drilled into you. So I majored in engineering. I prioritized my family's financial stability uh, and my you know, opportunity to get a job after college and all that. The only kind of connection I still kept with comics was I used to doodle in class when I was bored. And I doodled mainly because I wanted to make my friend, one of my best friends, laugh in class. He had a very boisterous laugh. And when we got bored in class, I would doodle stuff and I would send it to him just so I can, so if I make him laugh, I win, right? If the teacher notices us, by the way, don't do this. <laughs> This is not an endorsement of this behavior. Uh, but that's the only way I had kept my connection with comics. Uh, this is like an example doodle that I used to do. Very bad drawing, right? Even the, 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 the writing is like very like mediocre. But you know, I he used to be obsessed with getting hired by Boeing, for example. And so I used to just, I did all these small doodles like, oh, you know, he's waiting to pick up for the, for the phone call and all that stuff. And then he gets somebody else to call him. Very cheesy, but this is how I kept my like, relationship with comics going. Not intentionally, but because I had fun with that. Then I graduated. Graduated, moved to Connecticut, got my first engineering job. First time moving, you know, being alone. Finally got all that I wanted. I got my job. I was able to help my family pay off my loans, everything was good. Until a few years into the corporate world where I was just very clearly, I realized that I can't do this for 40 years. 
It's just, I can't, you know, like I get it. I, I got what I want. You know, I got made my parents proud. Yes, but I'm not happy to do this. I'm not happy to spend 40 hours every day for 40 years on this profession. And so I was like, okay, that means I need to just do things. I need to try different things, you know, whether it's a different job or for me, what drew me in was doing my own business, trying new businesses. And then I tried many different business ideas with my, one of my coworkers, a lot of app ideas, especially. We had an idea about tra a travel app where, you know, you'd have information crowdsourced where you travel and it would tell you about the best spots to take pictures, right, where other people took pictures. Uh, we had an idea about parking lots. In New Haven, Connecticut, street parking was such a hassle and we kind of wished that we had a way to tell what street parking was available and so we thought oh maybe if we you know had a sensor that would tell us and then it's an app it would tell it and then we'd see that and we're like oh yeah we wouldn't go on that yeah, all that stuff but all of these didn't stick they would fizzle out and the reason was because we were mainly doing it because we just wanted something else to do and it wasn't like something that was connected to us at a personal level like the problem wasn't a personal problem that we wanted to solve or we were like excited and passionate about it was just like a good idea until it on comics and the jember story came to my mind so i was at work i very distinctly remember this i was at work at my corporate job in my engineering profession when i first got the idea for jemba and the way it came about is I saw this news about this uh, educator in Ethiopia using these Ethiopian Powerpuff Girl versions to tell, to educate young girls about girls' rights uh, and, and just health and, and edutainment, basically, education and entertainment. I saw that and then it's almost like a light bulb went to my head and I said, why have we never seen you know, why have I never seen or enjoyed any authentic African stories that had diverse African history, mythology, and culture involved in it? And so then I started to create Jember, and the Jember story is really, it's about a young guy who just graduated from college, uh, but he doesn't have a job. Uh, and so he's feeling sort of hopeless and worthless because he's done all the right things and he couldn't get a job. These are some uh, the early designs of Jember when we first started out. Um, and you know, I figured what would happen if this person in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, was given superpowers? How would he use this and change his life? Or does he, would he even care about helping people at the time? When, when you feel so helpless, would you care about helping other people in that space, right? Um, and it was really a thing that I wanted to, a story I wanted to tell just to say, oh man, there's something out there that exists that I would buy and I would read. So I looked for artists. I, I first wanted to find an Ethiopian artist, but I quickly realized that there wasn't a lot of Ethiopian artists currently doing in this profession. So I found an African artist, Stanley Obinne. Uh, Stanley had phenomenal art phenomenal work and he already has been doing a lot in the comic space in the African comic space and when I reached out to him it was like it was almost a Hail Mary because I just didn't think he would be like interested this new guy who hasn't produced any work he wants to hire me and work and then so I talked to him I sent him a message and he said yes mind blown so we started working we started designing and then we started really getting into incorporating some of the things that I saw when I was growing up, some of the things that made me feel normal, right? So like this is the full, the, the, the final design of Jemba. And you can see that green pattern there comes from the uh, embroidery designs of our traditional clothes. Uh, and then, you know, instead of a face mask, I thought, why not introduce face paint that some of our diverse and rich ethnic groups have in Ethiopia. I put that on there. And we kept building and building and building. We finished the story, finished the first issue. 
Here's some of the art. Again, just beautiful lines. I, I was just astounded that Stan was working with me, right? Um, and he went all out with it, very detailed. Like seeing these, seeing them just gave me so much joy. Even if they were never published, I was like, I can't believe an idea I had in my mind is physically here. I'm seeing it. It's beautiful. It's great. After the lines, they need to be colored. And the coloring expert, Toyin Ajizunobi, I have a video of him I'll show you in a bit. Uh, he did his thing, took it to a whole different level. And then the lettering came, right? And then in the lettering, I had a decision to make, which is, do I write this story in you know, Amharic, which is the language I speak, my native language, or do I write it in English uh, and, or translate one way or the other? And I had to decide, I, you know, I decided I would do both because it made it even more authentic for me to see it in my native language. It made me feel even more like we belonged in this space, right? So I did that, and again, another incredible uh, uh, response to this, which I'll show you later. Okay, now book is finished. It's all good. I have both the English and Amharic book. And then I froze, right? Because I was hit with like a huge imposter syndrome before I was publishing, before I was about to publish it. I'm like, I could just leave it here. Right? I did this for me, I did it here, you know, it's great. I know this thing exists, right? Maybe other people don't know, but I know. This is great, right? Uh, but then I, I was like testing it out with a few friends that I have and they absolutely loved it. Um, and so I was like, okay, you know what? I might give this a try. I'm gonna give it a try. If it doesn't work out, it's fine. At least I have loved the whole process of this journey and I love the story for what it is right now, right? So I made a post about it. You know, this is a big thing that I'm launching. Uh, and you'll know that you'll realize that in the creative journey, uh, making a good product is only the entry ticket. It's, you need to know how to be a good marketer, how to do a, a whole different host of business related things if you want to succeed in this industry, right? So I published it and it was, it was received phenomenally. I could not have expected all of the, the, the reception that it got. It blew my mind and gave me even more imposter syndrome. But I celebrated it for what it is, right? I was able to do this and this happened. This was incredible. It was hitting shelves. People were excited and the momentum of Black Panther also helped it a lot because at the time, I published right before Black Panther and Black Panther came out, a lot of people were looking for more of these types of stories. And so they found one right when they wanted it. So that was fantastic for me. <clears throat> Here are some of the responses I got in Ethiopia and, and, and people send me emails. Uh, and it was kind of these little pieces of encouragement that helped me say, oh, you know what, I can keep going. Maybe I'll keep going. And that's when I was like, okay, just in case this is a fluke or not, I should create another story, right? To see, am I, am I, do I really have something here or did I just get lucky, right? Uh, so I created the story, How We, which is, uh, it's a story again about <coughs> embracing uh, your true self, your true identity, and the power you have within. And it follows this Ethiopian American girl who's trying to reconnect with her heritage. She goes back to Ethiopia with her mom. And this time I went the route of fantasy instead of superhero. And, uh, you know, her mother gets kidnapped by this mercenary who comes out of nowhere, takes her in. She has to decide. She jumps jumps into this fantasy world that's inspired by an ancient Ethiopian kingdom, uh, Aksumite Empire. How many of you are familiar with the Aksumite Empire? Um, I know it exists, but we only heard about it, but we only like, covered it in, in world history, world history for like, uh, like one, one slide. 
I'm, I'm even glad to hear that you guys have actually, there's some of you who recognize it. That's fantastic to me. That is something I know for sure. If somebody had asked in 2004 when I came, nobody would know. Nobody, right? But even here, majority of you don't know. So we're sharing it. But this is a rich, rich history that we have as Ethiopians. Aksum Empire was one of the top four empires in the world during their time. In the world, next to Persia, next to China, you know, there's next to Rome. This is some, this is rich black history, African history that is not taught in schools, right? So I wanted to share more of that. I did a lot of research on that. I learned a lot. And how we also did phenomenally well. So now I was like, okay, this is for real. I do belong here. I can tell these stories in the way I want to tell them without any barriers. I learned about Kickstarter. How many of you are familiar with Kickstarter? Excellent. Kickstarter is one of the best routes for independent creators to really get control, creative control for yourself and to put out your work just the way you want it. Okay? So we put it up there. It was funded over 300%. We got all these multiple features. And one of the most incredible moments of my life, somebody cosplayed Howie and met me at a com Comic Con. I was just like, I can't believe this is happening. I'm the aerospace engineer who literally just read manga hiding from my friends. And now I'm here writing comics and people are wearing, you know, the costume of my character. This is incredible, right? Incredible. I couldn't have, have written this story if, you know, if you had told me. And then we had a new story, this story, Zufan. This one was, you know, I, I kind of felt like, okay, you know what? Now I need to push my limits, right? I need to go beyond what I had produced before. And this story is actually about uh, Ethiopia's story uh, against defending against Italian invasion in the 1800s. Uh, how many of you know that Ethiopia is the only African nation that has not been colonized? Excellent. Awesome. Now, that is an incredible story, right? Why was Ethiopia not colonized? What happened? Because it was constantly winning against, against, against Italy. Right? So, but see, this, this kind of story is not really shared in Western schools. And here, it's not, it's, I was so shocked that nobody knew about it when I came here, right? And so I wanted to tell that story. And I wanted to tell it in a very, a new way because. Ethiopians have heard this story so many times. We celebrate it every year. There's anniversaries for it. So I wanted to make it new, so I twisted it into a sci-fi story where Europeans coming to Africa was a metaphor that was changed into aliens coming to Earth. So Earth represented Africa, and the only nation that wasn't colonized on Earth would, have, would be Africa which represented Ethiopia. And you'd get to hear that story and relive that story through what, what exactly happened, right? This is a story about uniting despite differences. That's really what this story is about. Because that's what, the, what, that's what had to happen for Ethiopia to successfully defend its independence from Italy at that time. Uh, I'm gonna pause here because I wanna show you um, a quick video from my colorist who put together a video to show you uh, how he does coloring. Uh, and he has a Zufan page on, so I think this will be a good spot. I think here. And Hi everyone, my name is Tony Najit Mobi, um, also known as Mobi. And the color artist. Oh, nope. sorry. Artist. My primary role is to apply colors to the pages. Um, I enjoy work closely with the line artists. Um, most times I work with Stanley, Stanley Obende. So usually what I do is apply um, colors to come up with the pages. And um, so today I'm going to be showing you guys how I I promised I would record this video for him, so I won't show you. By a song called Zufan, Zufan Rotsu. Um, okay, I hope I'm just going to be inspiring to you. I hope you learned something from it. So yeah, there it is. 
software I usually use for coloring pages is called Tape Studio Paints. And the very first um, stage of you know, coloring any comic page is called flattening stage. Basically what we do is create a base on which we're gonna, the details are going to rest on. So as you can see, I'm kind of doing like a coloring book style, putting each flat color where it's supposed to be for each character, reds, where it's supposed to be, purples, yellows, the color of the skin, and just doing something basic. And this is the basis on which my details are going to rest. So that's the next stage now. So now I'm going to start working on uh, the details. So usually I like to detail the background first, um, but for this first panel, I just worked on the faces. That was all that was in the first panel. But you'll see subsequently in the next few videos that I just, the next few panels that I just worked on the background first. So you can see me putting the green lights in the, um, the second panel there, just setting up the environment because um, usually these characters have to live in an environment so I like to make sure the environment is painted first before I work on the characters themselves. So I'm trying to get some materials down there, the floor, making the floor reflective, um, just making sure the light you know reflects on the floor there. Um, the fourth panel is kind of like an outdoor space scene um, where some stuff is happening on the meteor. Um, Sorry, not a meeting. I think it's an asteroid. So I don't want to give away too much of what's going on in the comic book. So yeah, you can see I'm working on the, um, the characters now, designing the characters and making sure I you know, make them more recognizable, distinguishable. Um, so yeah, basically, and it's easier now, especially because I've worked on the environment, so I know the colors that the characters should have. So as you can see in the last panel, it's the same old principle. I'm working on the environment first. I want to make sure I set up the, what the atmosphere will feel like. It's supposed to be a big scene, so I want it to feel massive. So I'm putting all the um, flares, um, I'm fading out some lines a bit, and um, just making it feel like there's an atmosphere. So I'm working on the characters now, and um, basically trying to make them pop out. So that's why I make them very, very dark. Um, this is basically a technique in, in comic book making, where you make characters really, really dark, so they come, they stand out of the background that you are on. So I, I'm maintaining the dark tones here, as you can see, and of course working on the complexion. And I just make a really, really bright light that highlights them. Um, then adding some final details to the characters. And yeah, that's pretty much it. My biggest advice for anyone that wants to um, get good at art, get into the art space generally is to focus on getting as being as valuable as you can um, that is just focus on being as skilled as you can um, it really helps when you can tell your stories you can help other people tell their stories and you don't have to worry about your skill um, for me personally that's been one of the major things that makes this thing fun is that you know i spend i spend and i, and I spend a lot of time improving my skills so that it doesn't get in the way when i have to um, tell stories or um, join teams that have to tell stories. So that's really it, you know, get really good, um, work with your fundamentals. It's, it gets boring at times, but it's fun eventually when you can actually tell the stories you want to tell um, with your art. So yeah, thanks a lot. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I need to go back to the slide deck now. Sorry about that. I am not too familiar with this Mac. So that was Zufan. That was Toyin from Lagos, Nigeria. We use all African artists uh, to do our work. So again, Jember, Zufan, Howie, African comics created by African storytellers, different genres, superhero, fantasy, sci-fi, and there'll be more, right? This is not the, this is just the beginning of it. <coughs> But of course, these kind of stories also led me to find out there are incredible heritage that we have that, that 
we haven't even explored yet. Ethiopia is not new to comic or sequential storytelling. This is art, this is actual art from 17th century uh, that we did in monasteries to tell stories, religious stories, right? And they used to be called, these illustrated stories used to be called sensuals, okay? And we, what we want to do going forward is just like how Japanese have created manga and made it their own medium, we want to use our own heritage to create our own type of storytelling, right? Really embrace what our heritage has left us. And so we have coined the term sensil, which is derived from two Amharic words, sensel, which means chain, and sil, which means art together, is chained art. The name pays homage to the sensul art form that I just mentioned about, the religious art form, but it doesn't dilute it either because we don't want to erase that. Right, that's still being done in religious monasteries. So we wanted to create this term and then build off of that to create our own medium, our own genre, our own table of visual storytelling, right? Because there's so many rich history that we can share. And I think, and here's a few samples of kind of what we did to experiment with it, right? We just said, okay, what if I take the Jemba art that I have and make it exactly what that you know past art is like, and then we kind of start transitioning. Okay, we need to make it more look a bit more dynamic, a bit more attractive to fans of manga and anime. And so this is kind of the evolution of the designs we've been doing, right? Uh, and we'll get better and better at it to make it something very unique and authentic. Of course, our goals and dreams don't stop there. We would love to be into animation. We would love into video games. This is just a, a render that uh, one of our artists did as sort of an aspiration, as a, as a visual board for us to kind of aim for it, right? To make things more real for us, right? Uh, so we'd love to get into all these other mediums. And I think that is my last slide. Uh, so I hope that I shared with you uh, you know, kind of a, um, a very realistic journey of what the creative journey may look like. I hope you found it helpful. Uh, thank you so much for coming. And because you did come, we did want to gift you signed issue once of how we, our fantasy story. So you guys will uh, pick that up as you go. Uh, and again, thank you so much for coming. Okay? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot about that. <laughs> yes, so um, at this point, first of all, thank you, Besarat. That was engaging. I always feel like uh, I've been an individually self-taught African scholar, but there's always something new to learn. Mm. And I definitely did that today. Did anybody learn something new? Everybody. So... script and when I write it I write it for Stan nobody else like Stan is the one who takes that art, the line artist Stan he takes that and he makes it into an image but then what he does is he reads it and he tells me this doesn't work I want to do this to it I think this will make it better and I'm 99% of the time I'm like 
yes, that makes more sense. Because I trust that his visual expertise is way better than mine, right? And so it's very collaborative, very iterative. We brainstorm ideas, we throw things, and see what sticks. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, that's again very iterative process. But I think so. A lot of stuff that we do. Um, my name is Besserat. Besserat de Bebe. B-E-S-E-R-A-T, B-E-S-E-R-A-T. Um, so <clears throat> when, we, when it comes to design, uh, what we do is we try to consider so many different aspects because like even skin tone is a huge thing, right? Having like a darker skin character versus a, a lighter skin character is a huge thing. Like the, the representation gap is so huge. So. We try to be very specific. Okay, what have I not seen, and what you know, like, and also, am I in a position to like share the story of this person? Like, can I tell this story? Right? Do I have the the, the right voice to tell that story? And so that's how we go about picking different designs, different things. We got to make sure that it's very, it's respectful to like wherever that identity comes from. <laughs> Right, so that's what we do. And we do a lot of research on hairstyles as well. You know, African hairstyles. <laughs> no, no, seriously. Like, there's such a huge, huge, huge uh, uh, um, mine of information on there. Like, they used to use hairs for different messages. Like, whether it's like maps or signs of fertility, or like, like readiness for marriage, or whatever, like there's so, so much rich culture just associated with it. You have to like know before you put it on your character, right? Okay, why am I doing this? And am I the right person to do this, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what we do. Yeah. What's um, Jember's power? Jember's power, he is, uh, he's solar. Uh, he has, his power is electric, but his, his, he gets his power because of the sun. Say that again. Yeah. 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 What would you say was the hardest part as far as like getting your foot in the door as far as comics? The hardest part. Uh, the hardest part, I think, is the journey can be pretty lonely if you don't have good team members, if you don't find community, uh, you can really get swallowed up in your own like criticism. Especially when you're starting out, you wanna be good, you wanna be really good, but you're not gonna be, that's the problem, right? In the beginning, you're gonna have, you're gonna put out projects that are just, I'm sorry for using this word, but shitty, right? And you're gonna improve on that, right? And you have to be, you have to have the, kind of the maturity to understand and accept that and keep going forward. And it's gonna be eating at you every time you see it and like, ah, I wish, I wish. And if you have community though, you would understand that that's normal, right? Uh, and th th another thing about that, the, the importance of community is a lot of creatives think that when they need, when they're trying to do a creative journey, they gotta go all out. Like they can't have a job on the side. Or you know, like it has to be um, two feet, you know, two full, 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 full in, you know, and all. But like 90% of people who start their journey, almost until they are like really famous, have had a full-time job on the side. You know, nobody talks about this stuff because it's so romanticized. But if you have community, you know, all right. So that's that's really the tough part. Yeah. The comics brand. Oh, great, great question. Uh, so 
<coughs> the logo is a, an incense uh, burner. Uh, and the word etan is an Amharic word that means incense. And the reason is that incense is a huge tradition in East African culture. Uh, it's usually, you know, the aroma of in incense is a big thing, especially when you're having big celebrations, having a fun time. Uh, and it just signifies, like when you walk in a room, if you smell the aroma of incense, it signifies you're about to have a great time, a family time, right? And so that's what I want people to feel when they read and pick up our books. Like, oh man, I'm about to go into a great story here, you know? So that's how the name came about. Yeah. So, would you have like the cartridge industry and the video game comic book industry closely related, or how would that work? Say, say that one more time for me. Do you know if the industries of cartoon making and comic book making and video game making are closely related at all, and how is that sort of like? Yeah. So, when you say cartoon making and video, like you're talking about animation, and yes, they're 100% very closely related. Uh, a lot of comic artists go to animation, uh, and most pitches for animation actually love having a comic. It makes it a whole lot easier to like look at and be like, oh, okay, I get it now. This makes sense. This can be really good. So yes, there's huge, huge connection there. Yeah. Drag your own story from that. Um, so would you say that the types of stories that you would come up with um, growing up in Ethiopia have changed with the American immigrant experience? Oh, absolutely. I mean, <coughs> so it's funny because um, uh, there's even I was I was reading a lot about how manga was influenced about by American culture as well. And it's so much, the, Im the influence of imported stories is so like, I can't even tell you, it's so deep within us, right? Um, so yes, I, I had a very different kind of mindset when I was back home and thinking about stories then, than I have now. And I think that's 100% normal and okay. And that just even makes your storytelling even better. Um, I think that we're supposed to grab things from where we're inspired by and kind of make the best thing that represents us and feels authentic to us. And so, yeah, that definitely, it definitely has changed and evolved for me. Yeah. Did you originally think of going into like animation for the idea or did you originally jump to comics? I jumped into comics. I, I didn't. I would love for it to be an animation, uh, but I jumped into comics, especially because comics. Uh, I, I I was a fan of comics, as I said, and then the barrier to entry for comics is supremely low compared to animation. Making a one-minute animation clip is super expensive, and it takes a lot of time compared to doing a comic that you can put out through Kickstarter, crowdfunding. You have so much control. So I went the comics route. Yeah. Um, do you or would you have your comics sold in Ethiopia so kids can have that experience you did with the Superman thing? Absolutely. They, they are sold in Ethiopia. And they're, they're a huge hit. And I was very happy. You know, when I first introduced them, I had a lot of pushback from publishers because they had this outdated assumption that you know, comics are not, you know, we, our culture doesn't really read, you know, we don't read comics like that. And, you know, the way I grew up, I would have agreed with them. I would have been like, oh yeah, I didn't really see comics when I was younger. I saw animated stories, I didn't see comics, so I wouldn't, you know, I don't know if I would have bought it and things like that. But the culture has evolved so much because of the influence of manga and anime that people read voraciously, right? They read a lot. And now, like, when they see stories that highlight and feature their history, like Ethiopian history and Ethiopian heritage, they love it. And so there was, it took a lot of back and forth and convincing. Uh, but yeah, now our stories are even translated in over 11 languages. And they're in, available in Arabic, French, Spanish. They're available in Walmart, uh, Amazon. Like.
So it's, uh, it's been really, really gratifying to see the reception of all that. Yeah. Yeah. You talk, are you talking about U.S. publishers? Yes. Okay, so I was, I was mainly talking about Ethiopian publishers because I had a lot of pushback there. With U.S. publishers, I haven't had, like, so I haven't, I haven't actively pursued being published by, like, Dark Horse or Image Comics or things like that, primarily because, uh, one, I didn't think that, so we're a small team. We publish one book. It takes us like three months. We can't like a dark horse, and, and and their pace is like one book, one one issue a month type pace. It's very fast, and usually they prefer graphic novels, right? They're thicker books, uh, and so I didn't think I could keep up with that kind of stamina and endurance that they have. So I I didn't really reach out to them. Um, so I would I would like to eventually reach out to them, but for me right now the most sustainable form of the business is crowdfunding it and going through it by ourselves and direct to cons con consumers. That has been the best thing that we have done. So I don't have too much experience with like uh, publishers, you know, US publishers pushing back on me for, for stories. Yeah, yeah, no, they're, all of them uh, are uh, tied to the story and also they are uh, from Ethiopian uh, background. You're talking about the name of the characters? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So a lot of them are like, in, they come to, they like, it doesn't come to me. The names come to me actually like later or something. I first think about when I create a story, <clears throat> it's very, the process for me, I, I don't know about more, more, more people, other people, other writers, but for pro the process for me usually is, I think about this like world or character that I, I'm, I'm envisioning and what their troubles are. And then I try to pinpoint what the message I'm trying to say is, because all stories are really like messages, like we're just sharing things, right? That's the origin of stories is all about sharing lessons from with one another. And so I try to nail that down. And then in that process, the, these names come to me as I learn more about the characters, their challenges, and what they stand for, what their problems are, and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Is Jember the only one that has multiple issues, or, or does it have any? No, they do. So Jember has, uh, so Jember has issues up to, so it has a graphic novel. Right, it has a 128 page graphic novel. Howie has up to issue three, issue one, two, three. So with the next issue, it's gonna be upgraded to a graphic novel. And Zufan is the new issue, has issue one already. Issue two is about to be published in like a few weeks. So. And I, I'll just say, if any of you want to, you know, if you have any more questions in the future, or if you have, if you wanna get in touch with us, uh, you can subscribe to our mailing list, which I can pass around here, or you can follow uh, our, us on social media. I like to be as helpful as possible to up and coming artists and people in the visual arts space for questions and things like that. So please stay in touch. I'm most active on newsletters. Uh, that's where I usually engage a lot with people, but I also try to be very engaging on social media. Okay, so whenever you can, f feel free to sign up here if you're interested if uh, or i can pass this around i don't know which you guys prefer whichever one just sign here when before you on your way out if you want to stay in touch and if you have any questions please keep them coming